Welcome back. We are in Senior English B. And our objective now for the hour is to continue with our study of T.S. Eliot. And we now are going to turn to one of his most famous poems, The Hollow Men. I'm with you, first of all, in 1161. And uh, you're taking a few notes over this topic of T.S. Eliot's allusions. This is not I-L-L-U-S-I-O-N-S, -S, uh, what a magician does but rather what a poet does, or what a writer does, making literary references to another text. And we're going to see a lot of this happening in this poem. Uh, scholars of this poem, and there's lots of them, have identified at least four allusions, and, to, and they're, they're listed there for you in 1161 1162. Uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness tells the story of a, of a wild and violent man named Kurtz who goes into the inner continent of Africa, and turns what we would call native. Uh, the gunpowder plot, for those of you who've ever seen the film V for Vendetta, you know about maybe Guy Fox and the whole thing of uh, trying to blow up Parliament. Uh, of course, you're familiar from your sophomore year with your study of J.C. and Dante's Divine Comedy, I think we maybe uh, mentioned through Dante's Inferno in uh, the Senior English A uh, course. Let's turn to the poem now. Let me make a couple of introductory observations. And then we'll read the poem in exegete, all right? The first thing I'd like to say about T.S. Eliot's Hollow Men is that in some ways it's often referred to as the cliff notes for Wasteland. I'll say it again. The cliff notes for Wasteland. In other words, Wasteland 1922 is his most famous poem. In some ways, Hollow Men is kind of like that poem only in cliff notes, in short, in abbreviation. Number two. This poem is maybe Eliot's darkest statement of the modern individual. He calls the poem The Hollow Man. Okay? Let's jump to, to B real quickly. Notice, although sometimes this is lost on readers the first time, starting on 1163, do you see the Roman numeral 1? Turn the page. Roman numeral 2, 3, others page. Roman numeral 4, Roman numeral 5. Do you see that? Not unlike some of these other poems that we've seen, you have now sections. I highly recommend at level one that you jot down those five Roman numerals, skip a few lines in between, and as we work through the poem and exegete, you'll then have some kind of brief summary of each one of those parts. And if you do that, then you're going to do okay in terms of knowing what the poem is about. Let's now turn to <clears throat> 1163. And we'll now read this poem. Okay? We will be committing to memory uh, the first part of this poem. You can see these are very, very short lines. And so it's actually pretty easy to memorize these lines. Let's take a look at the poem itself. You should now be reading 1163 with me. <coughs> the Hollow Men. We are the hollow men. We're the stuffed men. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dry voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless, as wind and dry grass or rats feed over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes the death of the kingdom, remember us, if at all. Not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams and death's dream kingdom. These do not appear. There the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging and voices are in the wind singing, more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, Cross staves in a field, behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meaning in the twilight kingdom. This is the dead land. This is cactus land. Here, the stone images are raised. Here, <clears throat> they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in death's other kingdom, waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss? form prayers to broken stone. The eyes are not here. <coughs> there are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. 
In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on the beach of this tumid river. Sightless, unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom, the hope only of empty men. Here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. Life is very wrong. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is, life is, for thine is the, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. <clears throat> now, there is so much history of this poem that we are only going to uh, really scratch at the epidermis. But let's go ahead right away and just jump right into the poem. And I'm going to start at stanza one. All right? At part one. You have, of course, a couple of references to begin this poem. One is a reference to Conrad's classic Heart of Darkness and a story about this guy named Kurtz who, at the end of the story, dies a lost man. And that's probably all you need to write down right now about Kurtz. He was a lost man, lost and a violent man. A penny for the old guy is, of course, going to be the saying about a cat named Guy Fox who thought he would go ahead and end all of Parliament by putting bombs underneath Parliament and blowing up everyone in Parliament. He was caught before he did it. And Guy Fox always will symbolize the voice of anarchy, the voice to war against the norm. Again, Guy Fawkes and Kurtz both have in common violent and lost. In both counts, their life ends in a violent end. But now let's take a look at the poem itself, shall we? We'll work with uh, part or stanza part one uh, the most uh, of this poem, okay? So let's take a look at it real quickly. Notice, we are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men. Whoa, whoa, whoa! A couple of things to point out right away. Let's go ahead and write down in our notes the word paradox. What does that word even mean? An oxymoron is a paradox. What's a paradox? When two things what? Don't fit together, right? Don't fit together. What does it mean? We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. How can you be both hollow and stuffed? Hollow here means what do you think? Empty. empty. How can you be empty and full at the same time? How can you be both hollow and stuffed? Like a stuffed animal in what way? How is a stuffed animal hollow? Not alive. Good, not alive. Obviously stuffed by virtue of stuff inside. Notice it isn't a stuffed animal, but it's very close that Elliot goes to. Look at the word picture next. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw means what? Scarecrow. Scarecrow. Very good. So he looks at modern human beings and says, we're hollow, empty, we're stuffed. Full of stuff. Full of what kind of stuff? What are we so full of in our modern era, do you think he's referencing? Write it down. What do you think he's talking about? Full of what? Let's concentrate on that first word. Notice it's not you are the hollow man. You are the stuffed man. It's not I am the hollow man. I am the stuffed man. Notice what it is. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. What do you make of the fact? Jot it in your notes. What do you make of the fact that he uses the pronoun we instead of I or you? What do you make of that fact? Everybody's in this project. We're all the same. Nobody gets out of this project. Whatever this critique is going to be, 
You want to write this in your notes. This is T.S. Eliot's critique of modernity. And he begins by saying, we are all in this together. Nobody gets to read this poem and go, geez, you know what? He's absolutely right about those other people. Even the poet speaker himself is included in hollow, at the same time, stuff, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. You got lots in your brain, but you got nothing. Think of all the crap they've taught you since you started as a kindergartner. You are in your 12th year of this. I've had seniors that go, I never really realized this, thought of it. 12 years you've been doing this thing called school. Think of all the crap that you've tried to put into your brain. You clearly know more than you did when you were in kindergarten, or do you? Or do you? We're full of a lot of stuff. What are we empty in regards to? What's missing in the life of most seniors in high school? What have you lost along the way that you're struggling to try and find again? Uh, see how this works? you got all this stuff in your brain that you've learned. It's amazing. But look at all that you've lost that you don't have. Eliot says this is the human condition, and it leads to that word, alas. It's not a word we use anymore. If you saw your best pal, <clears throat> and you said, you know, you sat out next to them, and your best pal, you go, how's it going? And your best pal does this. <sighs> what would that mean? What would that mean to you? Write it down, because that's what the word alas means. <sighs> what would that mean? How would you describe that sound? Would you go, oh, you clearly are way happy right now. No. What would you say, Shay? <sighs> Something's wrong. Keep going. <sighs> Maybe frustration, aggravation. <sighs> That's this word. This word is alas. Look what he says next. Our dried, look at all the adjectives. If you want to be a good, if you want to be a good writer, pay attention to how Eliot uses his verbs and his adjectives. Notice, our dried voices when we whisper. Our dried voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Think of all of the words you spoke yesterday. Think of all the words you've spoken since September in your senior year. If somebody was following you around and every single word had been typed out and somebody hit a print key. Think of all the texting of the last year. If somebody just hit the print key and printed all of those words out, two observations. One, lots of words for most of us. Would you agree with me? Lots and lots of words. Two, how many of those words mean anything of any true value? I've had seniors that say, you know what, I think you're kind of right on this. Do you get a sense of this? We speak a lot and say most absolutely nothing. So much so that even when we try and speak real words, we have a difficult time. Right? We use words so cavalierly. The guy who said to his girl, I love you. And she stepped away from him and said, what do you even mean when you use that word? He was like, what do you mean, what do I mean? She said, what do you mean? Explain to me what that word means for you. You know what it means. He got mad. You know what it means. And she said, I know what I think it means. I want you to tell me what you think it means. Explain it to me. He tried. He couldn't come up with the answer. We use words with each other, and we don't even hear what we're saying. We text, what are you doing? I don't know, what are you doing? I don't know, what are you doing? But that's our whole life. We spend all of our time speaking words. Notice for 
Elliot, though, it's whispering. And what is the simile, a comparison using like or as? See, I can teach this to you because you live out here. You know what it's like to go out into the badlands in the late afternoon and listen to the wind blow through the sagebrush? That's what he says our talking is like. We talk all the time. We say absolutely nothing of any importance. His two similes are compelling. One, wind blowing through sage. The other one is this sound. Everyone be real quiet and listen. It's this sound. Rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. This. We talk all the time. We text all the time. We say nothing. Then we engage, for Elliot, in a series of hyperboles. Now, let's use that term. We're going to use three terms. They all mean the same thing, but it's time for you to learn this word. Hyperbole, paradox, oxymoron. Some, some of you may be pronounced it as oxymoron. Oxymoron. That is to say, things that don't fit together. Elliot's going to say something about the modern condition. Something about what it's like to be a senior at Worland High School. Something just doesn't quite fit. Shape without form. Can you have shape without form? So you think of it. Shade without color. Can you have shade without color? <clears throat> Look at the next one. Par paralyzed force. What about this one? Gesture without motion. Can you make a gesture without doing a motion? Elliot says, yeah, you can. You do it all the time. It's called high school. What are you talking about? These two things are op opposites. He says, it's called the life we get to live. Which is why, <sighs> that's why we feel like this. <sighs> then he says something that for some of my seniors becomes... Maybe one of the most profound observations. You can drop your pens. Trust me, you won't forget this one. This is one of the most compelling observations that any poet you're going to read will make. How about this one for a second? <clears throat> Somehow, we're able to bring your great, great, great grandma back and set her right here in front of you. Your great, great, great grandma. Bring her back. She's sitting here. You walk into this room and you say to her, you just don't understand, great, great, great grandma. It's hard for me. It's a hard life. I got stress. I got a hard life. My life is tough. I got these people want me to do all this stuff and I'm a high school senior. Ugh, what am I going to do after I graduate? You don't have any idea how hard it is. Do you have any idea what it would feel like for your great, great, great grandma to not say a word but just look at you in the eye and just look at you you're great 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 grandma you don't know anything about her but you know one thing she'd look at you and say seriously you're gonna tell me you got it rough really really this is what you're telling me compared to the life I had to live. All of our sacrifices, she might say, from our generation, so you could have what you got and this is what you do? This is the life <clears throat> you live. This is your life? This is it? This is who you decided to be with all the stuff we did. Do you have a sense that at some point in that conversation your eyes would do this? Do you have a sense of that? Like, I won't look in her eyes no more. When I start telling her how hard my life is, how stressed out I am, she just looks at me. I have a sense I kind of do one of these numbers. Never mind. Look how Elliot says it. He has a, he has a picture. It's a disturbing picture. There's two groups of us. Those of us who are alive and those of us who have already lived and died who are on the other side and they're watching your great, great, great grandma watching. Her eyes, the adjective is direct. What do you think that means, direct eyes? 
Do you have a sense your great, great, great grandma might look at you with direct eyes? Bam! And your eyes, oh no, I do not want to look at you. Okay, sorry about that. Right? Look how he says it. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, your great, great, great grandma, remember us, dash, if at all, dash, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. He says, I want to go to the other side. What's that mean? What's that mean, I will go to the other side? He says, I want to die. Why doesn't he want to die? Why doesn't he want to die? Because if he dies, he's got to go to the other side. Where your great, great, great grandma is waiting for you. And she's going to look at you. And in that moment, he says, I want to see those eyes. Because the minute I see those eyes... It's an interesting question. Are you living a life that your great, great, great grandma or grandma would be proud of? Or would they look at you and say, that's it? That's it? That's what you call the first 18 years of your life. Seriously. That's what you gave your energies to? That's what you did with your time? What have you produced of any value? The speaker of the Holloman says, if you remember us at all, you probably won't, you'll only remember us as hollow, empty, stuff. Whoa, let's just say this. We're, we're through the first part of a five-part poem. <laughs> let's jot down, is this a happy poem? Some of us will say, well, this is like the nastiest attack, especially because notice it's we are the hollow men. Nobody gets out. Nobody gets to say, you know what? You're absolutely right. Most of the students that were in high school are just empty. They're so hollow. They do all this, all this really stupid stuff. That, uh, uh, this poem does not let you get away so easy like that. We, everybody's in this. It is the human condition. I'm always reminded of this line and this idea, part one, when I go to a mall, Especially when I go to a high-end mall. A mall where there's really wealthy kids who get to shop there. And they're walking down the hall. Do you know these wretched places, these malls? Oh, it's just like pornography. It's wretched. And they're walking down these halls and they've got all these bags that they've purchased. But you look in their eyes and they're like zombies. Has the thought occurred to you that the films and the games that you play that have so much to do with zombies are a critique of your time? They're saying in code language, you want to see zombies, you don't have to play against them on a game. All you got to do is go to a mall and just watch how everyone walks around with this glazed look on their eyes and their face. They got nothing. Watch it. Here in a second when a bell rings, walk out into the hall and just start looking at people's faces and be reminded of this poem. And about that, your great-great-great-grandma says, all the sacrifices, all of the hard work, and this is what you produce. This is your generation. This is your time. By the way, Eliot writes this poem before 1922. He is critiquing a time almost 100 years ago. Eliot writes this poem almost 100 years ago, and he's already saying about the human condition, well, put it in your notes now. What's he saying? What is he saying about what it means to be a modern person? We got lots of this, and we got none of this anymore. Some of you live, and you see, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you live with old men who can outwork in any 18-year-old you know. They make you feel insignificant, with the way they can work. Would you agree with me? Some of you have grandmas who can outwork right now any guy. You know what I'm saying? And you kind of look at that and you go, what happened? Where did the work ethic go? Where did the drive go? Where did the passion go? We are the hollow men. We are the stuff men. The rest of the poem now is easy to read. Eliot is going to tell us what he thinks went wrong. What he thinks went sideways. What happened? Notice he, he talks about those great, great, great grandma's eyes down, uh, you know, on the other side. Take a look at it. Eyes I dare not, I don't want to meet them. Eyes I dare not meet in, day, in dreams, in death's dream kingdom. These do not appear. 
There, the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There's a tree swinging, and voices are in the wind singing more distant and more solemn than a fading star. He does not want to go. Look what he says. Let me be no nearer in Death's dream kingdom. Dude, whatever happens, i got to stay alive, and here's why. I don't want to die, and here's why. Because if I die, i got to go see my great-great-great-grandma, and I do not want to see those eyes. Those eyes, one second of looking into those eyes, and my whole life's going to feel like I did absolutely nothing. Rough critique. Notice he says, let us, let me wear deliberate disguises. Have you, have you got a sense of this? We're in high school. A bunch of scarecrows walking around the halls with disguised faces like masks. Nobody wants to let anybody know what's really going on. How's it going? Oh, it's great. It's great. Liar. Liar. Your life isn't great. Your life sucks. And you won't say it out loud. Everybody wears the disguise. But we text a lot. But do you really know the people you text? Do you even have any clue? You live with people at home. You don't even know who they are. Some of you stopped looking at your parents so long ago. You can't even recreate what they look like right now. Who are these people you live with? Who are your friends? He says, we all kind of have these disguises. Like scarecrows, notice. Such deliberate disguises, rats coat, crow skins, cross staves in a field, behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that fight. He says it again. Whatever happens, dude, I, he goes, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of what happens after I die. What if I got to go over there and meet my great, great, great grandma who's going to look at me and go, this is the best you could do. This is what you call the life. Pathetic. Whoa. Whoa. And yet, even though you don't know your great, great, great grandma, you kind of have an intuition the speaker of this poem may be right, right? What was it like before you could pull up at 20 below zero with a heater? <laughs> Can you imagine that? What was that drive between Casper and Shoshone like when you were in a covered wagon and it's 15 below? Whoa. What's that like when you don't get up in the morning and crank on a faucet to get your water, you gotta walk out and bust up some ice to hope you can get some water. Start a fire, because that's the best you're gonna get. What would that be like? See, we live in a strange place where we ought to be conscious of this, right? These are hard, tough people that kind of, we kind of have a tendency to forget. Huh? The next one will make sense to you, because you live in the middle of the desert, don't you, in Badlands. His word picture is, this is dead land. This is cactus land. And then he says something interesting about our lives. He says, here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under a twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in death's other kingdom? Look what he says we do. Waking, alone, at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss form prayers to broken stone. Two things of really interesting importance here. And I'll, I'll have to, I apologize, i got to hurry through this. By 1920, Eliot's already making this observation. Have you, have you noticed this? We have lots more sex, and nobody enjoys it. I've said this before, and seniors go, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Analyze it. Analyze what you watch on TV and in movies. Lots more sex. No more fun. Lips that would kiss form prayers to Boca Stone. There's a second one. This is... Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, the Sea of Faith, was once two at the full. What is wrong with the modern condition for T.S. Eliot? We lost our capacity to believe. It's not that we don't pray. It's that our prayers are to broken stone. Nobody really believes in it anymore. And because nobody believes in it anymore, we're the hollow men or the stuffed men. And then he goes to Dante. Are you familiar with Dante's picture? <laughs> this gets darker. Are you familiar with Dante's picture? The moment you die, you immediately wake up. Only you're completely naked. Completely naked. And you're standing in this strange place with millions of other naked people. Only nobody's thinking about a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. Nobody's thinking about sex. The minute you arrive, you realize it's kind of not real clear. And you immediately realize you've got thousands of people all standing, and everybody's pushing. Nobody wants to go forward. 
Forward, there's a river. Beyond the river, two things. Tremendous stench, the worst smell you've ever imagined, and the worst screaming you've ever imagined. Screaming like a million, billion people are all being tortured at the same time. So you push, push back. And then you realize it. Oh crap, I'm dead. Dante says, then you go, oh crap, I'm dead and I'm, I'm outside of Inferno. Inferno's there. Nobody wants to go, which is why everybody's pushing. But in the split seconds after you were dead, guess what? A few thousand more people on the earth died and they're behind you and obviously they don't want to go either. So everybody's pushing, pushing, trying to stay away. Elliot will draw on this image to finish. There are no eyes here, right? There are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars, this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech gathered on the beach of the Tumid River, just like Dante, right? Only Dante pointed out, you don't got to die to go to hell. All you got to do is go to London or go to the streets of New York and just walk the streets and look at people's faces. They look like zombies. There's no life left in them. Strange, so you'll say. Walking the halls of Arlington High School are kind of like looking at zombies. The final section, here we go around the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Of course, we're playing a child's rhyme game, aren't we, right? What is this, thine is the kingdom? Does anyone know that? Those are words that come from what? That's right, from the Bible. What from the Bible? Do you know? <laughs> Thine is the kingdom is the Lord's prayer. Notice our speaker here. He knows enough of the Lord's prayer to say a few words, but he can't remember how it goes. The final stanza of this poem tells us how the world ends. We do not have the courage even to blow ourselves up the way Guy Fawkes or the way Kurtz would act. But rather, he says, the end of our world is simply a whine, and then somebody turns out the lights. Whoa! A whimper. Okay, let's finish real quickly now at 2 a. What is the point of a depressing poem like this? Why would T.S. Eliot write a poem like this? Why should we read a poem like this? Possibility of change. Good, let's, let's write it down. Eliot will argue, you can't become something other than hollow until you recognize how hollow, how empty, how useless your life has been to this point. Eliot would argue, reading a poem like this can remind you every day, try and be a little less empty. How does that begin? Quite literally, focus on the way you use words. Right? So the next time you're with somebody you care about, actually try and listen to what he or she's saying, right? So it's, it's one way. Thanks, guys. We'll uh, come back tomorrow and talk some more Elliot.